Right. So, Shalma, uh, you've been studying physics now for quite a few years. You know, you're a couple of years in the grad <laughs> school and did all that undergrad stuff at Chicago. Have you noticed anything about the kinds of personalities that physicists <laughs> and physics students tend to have? This is a dangerous question. To oh, ask. I know. I know it is. <laughs> That's why and I'm not I don't know. It. I fully want to answer. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, we, we know there are a lot of a very kind and mm -hmm. socially well-balanced uh, yeah. physicists out there. <laughs> But along with those, there are a lot of people who can be pretty arrogant, especially when it comes to being a physicist. Mm. There are at least quite a few people. And, and I, I think it was maybe more true a couple of decades ago. I don't know. May, may, maybe you can tell me if it's still true among physics students. But when I was a physics student, a lot of us thought you know, physics was like the top of the academic pyramid. Everything else built was like a lesser form of academic inquiry. Maybe they would consider mathematicians their equal, but they, they were pretty insistent that they were, you know, physics was really special. And by uh, being physicists or aspiring physicists, they were pretty special. And I guess like, you know, even for people who aren't that egotistical, like there is still the idea that, you know, it's the most... Yeah, you know, almost the bottom of the pyramid. It's like the like chemistry is just like an approximation of physics and bio is just an approximation of chemistry and like that whole idea that goes around and really everything's just physics or math. Exactly. So like some of them will just say that it's harder and that makes it more special. But the more interesting one is the one you were alluding to, the idea that it was somehow more fundamental, that, you know, physics is the foundation on which chemistry is built and chemistry allows you to build up things like biology, which allows you to build up psychology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and somehow by being on the top of this, this uh, fundamental pyramid, uh, physicists get a, a kind of privileged place in the scientific world. So let, let me give you an example of, of where physicists get this idea from. So um, if you took chemistry in high school or college, you might have learned how to use this thing called the ideal gas law. Um, it symbols, it reads PV equals NRT. Um, and it basically re relates the pressure of a gas under certain conditions to its temperature, volume, and the number of molecules in it. When this law was originally discovered, it was thought of like it was a law of physics, a, a fundamental piece of information about how our universe works. But by the end of the 1800s or so, it had become appreciated that this law, PV equals NRT, wasn't really fundamental, but instead follows directly from very old Newtonian laws of motion. In other words, you could start with Newton's laws and use them to show that the ideal gas law would have to be true. You could derive it from those laws. So from this perspective, the ideal gas law isn't a fundamental fact about our universe at all. Instead, it's a direct consequence of something else, namely the Newtonian laws of motion. The same thing is true for like the second law of thermodynamics and a lot of other things that you might have learned about in some high school chemistry class. Right. In other words, it's like if, you, if you're trying to study all the laws of the universe and you can't memorize everything, like what are the ones that you actually need to know to like derive the rest from? Exactly. Like, at least in principle, you could know a small number of fundamental things and use those to deduce all of the other things you might want to know about our universe. So in today's sort of unusual episode, we're going to break down this way of thinking about physics. Is it really the most fundamental science? And is that a useful way to think about it? Or is it just our egos getting in the way? This episode of Why This Universe is supported by Wondrium. Wondrium is a mind-blowing subscription service that offers thousands of video and audio courses on a huge range of topics. I've been a big fan and regular consumer of Wondrium's content for the last 15 years or so, and over that time I've listened to dozens of their courses, including ones on history, philosophy, literature, math, and science. For me, it's like taking an intro-level university course from a great professor on a subject you've always wanted to know a lot more about, but without the big tuition fee and all in the comfort of your own home or daily commute. I just started listening to a course on Wondrium called The Great Questions of Philosophy and Physics. Over 12 lectures, this course explores the relationship between physics and philosophy, 
asking questions like, do the things that physicists discover in their experiments necessarily exist? Or are they just convenient ways for us to conceptualize our world? For someone like me, this kind of course can really be a great thrill. So if you want to learn about the philosophy of science, or just about anything else for that matter, give Wondrium a try. You can sign up for Wondrium now through our special URL to get a free month of unlimited access. Just go to wondrium.com universe. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. My name is Shalma, and I'm a PhD student at NYU. And I'm Dan Hooper. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist at Fermilab and at the University of Chicago. So once you start ranking different discoveries or facts about our universe in terms of how fundamental they are, a certain kind of hierarchy does start to appear. At the top are certain kinds of physics, like things like general relativity and elementary particle physics. These things allow you to drive things that allow you to drive things kind of all the way down, right? And in addition to you know, you being able to derive other things with them, in principle, these are really simple theories. I don't mean they're easy to use or learn or something, but you can write down all of general relativity and the standard model of particle physics on like a cocktail napkin. And at least in principle, someone could take that information on that cocktail napkin and derive everything that you would ever want to know about chemistry. You could figure out the structure of the entire periodic table, You could work out kinds of atoms and molecules that might exist and all their properties. And all of this follows directly from the standard model of particle physics. So from this point of view, you could think of chemistry as really just an example of applied particle physics. It sounds really, really gross, right? Really arrogant, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm like like holding my tongue because I know we're not going to, we're going to get to the point where we talk about how this is not the best way to view this. Yeah, yeah. Just just for our listeners, um, I'm finding this cringeworthy as I say these words out loud. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I hope that, you know, maybe someone will be listening along and be nodding along to this part and be like, yeah, yeah, that all follows. A 23-year-old version of me would have been nodding along like, yeah, physicists are awesome. All right, so going down this chain of logic a little further, um, you could think of molecular biology as an example of or a a kind of applied chemistry. You can think of cellular biology as applied molecular biology and all the way down. You could even think of like psychology as uh, applied biology or the social sciences like economics or sociology as examples of applied psychology. So if you ask a philosopher what we're doing when we're thinking this way, they tell you you're being a reductionist. Um, A reductionist starts out by trying to discover or learn the most fundamental things they can and then use those fundamental facts to try to deduce other things about their universe. Uh, Like trying to derive the rules of chemistry from the laws of physics or whatever else you you might be setting out to do. You can also think of reductionism as a program in which you try to understand something by understanding its individual parts. So the fact that the ideal gas law is really just a consequence of the more fundamental laws of Newtonian physics is a good example of how reductionism can be useful. There, and there are lots of examples where reductionist approaches can actually teach you something about our universe and, 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 and get you farther in your ability to understand the world. Well, I mean, we we do that a lot in physics. A lot of physics is reductionism, right? Like, for example, we want to know, you know, what is, you know, the smallest quantity of thing that's making up our universe? You know, is it, we thought it was like protons, neutrons, and electrons, and then we found out that those were actually made of, or protons and neutrons were actually made of these quarks, and we're like, oh, these quarks and these electrons are the fundamental things, and like, like, it's not like we see it, we actually physically don't see a quark, but we're still like interested in breaking down every kind of matter into its constituent parts. And that's something useful. And to a a reductionist, those quarks are more fundamental and and maybe more important than the protons and neutrons are. Um, And there are lots of examples where a whole bunch of different phenomena 
were kind of appreciated. And then they were shown to all be parts of the same underlying, more fundamental facet of nature. Like uh, when Isaac Newton worked out that the same force of gravity pulls us down towards the earth and holds planets in orbits, you could explain all these previously, you know, independent things in terms of one idea, that one fundamental idea explains a lot by introducing something, you know, comparatively small. And this sort of thinking fuels our hunts for things like grand unified theories or theories of everything that might tell us everything or almost everything you'd want to know about the fundamental nature of the universe with just a few basic principles or laws. Okay, so so, so far, this whole reductionist approach to physics or to science even sounds pretty great. And physics gets to sit on top of this grand reductionist pyramid being the king of all the sciences. Um, but if you really look closely, you find that a lot of this isn't cracked up to be everything it uh, you know, is, claims to be. Um, let's take the relationship between physics and chemistry, for example. On the one hand, I am deep down totally convinced that if you really had an infinitely powerful computer, you could take the Schrodinger equation, quantum physics, and you could deduce anything you wanted to know about atoms and molecules and in the, their interactions. Like that, that's something that in principle should be, you know, accomplishable. But in reality, if you have like realistic computers, like computers that are, you know, the size of the universe or smaller or something like this, you just can't do this. You can't actually figure out much about chemistry. And in the real world, we can use the Schrodinger equation to understand really simple things like a single hydrogen atom pretty well. But any big atoms or, or, or molecules or the interactions between them, just forget it. It just can't be done. It's just too complicated. So in, in practice, if we had to rely on the principles of fundamental physics to try to understand chemistry, we would still know basically nothing about atoms and molecules. It would, 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 this is not an approach that will get us very far. And if you were trying to use a purely reductionist approach to go from, say, chemistry to things we know about biology, well, this would turn out to be even harder. First of all, biological systems are usually much more complicated than atoms or molecules are. And even more to the point, even if you had an infinitely powerful computer at your disposal, it just wouldn't be possible to use the principles of chemistry or physics to derive the structure of any particular biological organism. The kinds of organisms that could exist hypothetically in our universe might be dictated somehow by the laws of physics and chemistry, but which ones actually do exist well, that's the consequence of a long series of historical accidents that played out over billions of years of natural selection. So even with this infinitely powerful computer and uh, understanding of all the fundamental laws of physics, you could deduce what kinds of organisms could exist, but not which ones do exist. For that, you need you know, the scientific method through empiricism and all the stuff that biologists do. So even if we had a so-called theory of everything that described all of the fundamental particles and forces of nature, it's not really like we would actually understand the entire universe. We would still have to keep doing experiments and other forms of science to figure everything else out. Another limitation that you face if you take a purely reductionist approach to science has to do with the importance of complexity. A hardcore, like a really deep down reductionist might think that all of the really important stuff that we want to learn about our universe is this truly fundamental information. The facts about the smallest particles and things like space and time themselves. But when you put a lot of particles or other objects together, sometimes really new kinds of phenomena can begin to appear or emerge. These kinds of phenomena might not be fundamental in the usual sense of the word, but they're often really important and scientifically is interesting. And if you didn't, if you were just focusing on the fundamental objects, you would miss this stuff. You'd miss this interesting complexity or this emergent phenomena. Right. It's kind of the effect of greater than the sum of its parts. That idea of when you add all these little bits together, these new things emerge that you wouldn't have been able to predict. Exactly right. Like the universe really does work differently at different scales. 
like my favorite analogy to kind of convey this is has to do with the game of chess. So like you can take on a single piece of paper and write down all of the rules of the game. It's it's really a pretty simple game in that sense. But no one would argue that if you knew all those rules, you know everything there is to know about chess. Like literally like tens of thousands of books have been written about chess. Um, I know all the rules and I'm still a pretty mediocre chess player. <laughs> but even if you learned all of those rules, you know, you're not Gary Kasparov. You know, like the, the, that Gary Kasparov knows things about chess somebody doesn't know just because they know the rules of the game. So you take these fundamental rules of chess. You can think of the, the laws of the chess universe. And from those fundamental objects emerges this complexity of chess strategy, which seems to have no bounds or no or limits. And all sorts of stuff comes out of it that you know doesn't seem to be written into the rules and yet emerges from it in in the course of many, many, many chess games. Yeah, I, and I love this analogy too, because it kind of uh, points out that this is a pretty familiar phenomena. Like, ev like this happens in like almost all spheres. I feel like I even, you know, there are sociology ideas about this too, you know, you know, collective effervescence, these kinds of ideas, the study of the greater than the sum of its parts effective communities and multiple people coming together things that you can't just predict from like knowing a bunch of individuals and for some reason certain physicists can sometimes forget this and uh you know put on these reductionist blinders and they they miss they miss all the information that comes in the form of complexity we should disclaim that there are physicists who do really really think about complexity and emergence and Absolutely. there are physicists who are studying emergence of you know if you have a bunch of particles what happens that you wouldn't have predicted before Indeed. so it's not, it's not all physicists hashtag not all physicists but <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of complexity emerging from a simple set of rules comes up all the time in physics so the ideal gas law or the second law of thermodynamics for examples are both things that emerge from the structure of newtonian classical physics um, Newton's laws themselves don't say anything about gases and they don't have any conception of entropy built into them. But these principles that were laid down, you know, long before the ideal gas law or second law of thermodynamics were appreciated directly lead to those relationships. And in cases like these, we can use a reductionist approach to take the fundamental laws and derive how a group of objects might act collectively. But in other cases, it can be um, more useful to work in the opposite direction, to study the collective behavior as the primary thing and, and work out what the rules of that collective behavior is without any eye to the more fundamental, you know, constituents. And the proof that it works is like, if you think about the progress of science and like say progress that could be made in biology without any knowledge of physics, you know, that's almost like proof that this works. It's true. And, and like, we wouldn't really be able to do any chemistry from a, you know, fundamental physics perspective. Um, yeah. Good luck taking Newton's laws to predict, you know, you know, things about psychology or sociology or economics, <laughs> right? It just can't yeah. be done. Um, and even in physics, this is often the case in, in phenomena like uh, superconductivity or phase transitions that can take place. These are like deeply collective behaviors. You, you can't learn about a phase transition um, by studying elementary particles. That's not how these things work. We study phase transitions by studying the collective behavior of many, many atoms and molecules. The importance of complexity in the physical sciences has sometimes been overlooked by these like deeply reductionist-minded physicists. Um, and But some physicists have argued in the opposite direction too. A uh, really well-known advocate for these, like, quote-unquote, non-fundamental topics in physics is the Nobel laureate Phil Anderson. Anderson worked on a lot of areas of condensed matter physics, but he was most famous for his work on symmetry breaking and superconductivity. Uh, for years, though, I didn't really know about Anderson's work. I basically just knew him as this guy who had argued against the uh, superconducting supercollider, the SSC, back in the late 80s. So I entered into physics well after Congress had already canceled the, the, the SSC, that project. Um, but like a lot of other particle physicists at that time, I was still kind of bitter about it. And um, 
I often like would dream about how much more we would know about our universe if that experiment had gone forward. So I kind of held a grudge against people like Anderson for their arguments against it. I mean, they were arguing for their field and I wanted my field to win and we lost that one. So I guess I should get over it. But when Anderson passed away last year, my Fermilab colleague and friend, Sam McDermott, introduced me to some of Anderson's papers and other writings. And uh, like, needless to say, it turns out that there was, he's a lot more than just a naysayer of elementary particle physics. He had a lot of really interesting ideas, not just about physics, but kind of the philosophy of physics and especially the idea of complexity and collective behavior being really important as important as stuff we might think of as fundamental. I especially like this article Anderson wrote in 1972 that was titled, More is Different. In that article, he distinguished between what he called reductionism and constructivism. So he would admit that we can reduce things in nature to simple fundamental laws. So he, in that sense, he doesn't really argue against reductionism being a useful approach. But he says, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can always start with those laws and reconstruct everything that we might want to know about the universe. There's just a lot about our universe that we would never be able to know or understand if we were to rely on purely reductionist strategies. So one thing that Art Anderson's article got me thinking about was whether we should be sure or confident that what we think of as our most fundamental theories are really describing fundamental aspects of our universe at all. After all, you can take examples from condensed matter physics and that, of things that look a lot like particles, but are actually the phenomena that have to do with large numbers of atoms or other objects. So for example, if you take a, a grid of particles, like a crystal lattice, it turns out that there can exist quantized vibrations that can pass through those particles in a way that resembles what we might think of as a particle of sound. We call this thing a phonon, not a photon, but a phonon. And, in, and it's an example of what's sometimes called a quasi-particle. If you really zoom in at a phonon, you'll see that it's not a fundamental object. It's made up of lots and lots of atoms working in this collective way. But from this perspective, you know, it makes me want to ask if we really looked deeply more closely in new ways at a photon or maybe an electron or some other thing we think of as a fundamental object, is it possible that these things too would somehow be emergent from some more fundamental theory? All this is, of course, pure speculation, but maybe we'll never really be able to say that we can know with perfect confidence what is really fundamental and what is emergent in our universe. So it makes me wonder, I wonder what you think about this, like rather than asking, you know, what is the fundamental constituent of matter and of, of the universe that, that everything else is built out of? Like, do you ever think about, you know, what are the fundamental processes, like the fundamental behavior that just happen at different scales? Like you're kind of saying the similar like wave behavior happens in our particles and also happens in these like emergent situations with many, many particles. So maybe like you could think of just like, wave behavior or, you know, wave behavior kind of translating into particle behavior. Maybe that's a little confusing, but that being a fundamental aspect of the universe, even if it's not like uh, an object or like something that physically makes up the world. Yeah. So, so maybe instead of looking for the, the smallest elementary particles as our, you know, fundamental constituents of the universe, maybe concepts are fundamental things like forces or, things like space and time or, or you know, or, or, you know, or, or, or like you, you said, like maybe waves or something or like wave behavior or something like this. Um, I don't know, but my guess is if you treat any particular thing, whether it be an object or an idea or a concept as purely fundamental and you really fixate on that, you're probably going to miss things that don't boil down to those parts. So you're saying, like, let go of the idea of searching for the fundamental anyway. Let's just search for everything that happens and, you know, learn more about the world and not worry about what's fundamental because maybe we don't know. Yeah. In those circumstances where reductionist approach pays off, like, by all means, be a reductionist. Mm -hmm. But, like, don't be a zealot in your reductionism. You know, occasionally be able to 
you know, re relax your grip on the reductionism so that you can kind of see the forest for the trees. Yeah, I also like sometimes I think about emergence itself as a fundamental process, since it kind of does seem to happen at almost any scale that you look at. Like it happens in a chess game. It happens with particles. Like if you have enough particles, if you, it happens with, you know, atoms, if you have enough atoms, it happens with animals, if you have enough animals <laughs> or people, if you have enough people, like something new always emerges once you kind of zoom out and look at a larger scale. And it, it, it makes me feel like that is, it's maybe a, a less precise use of the word fundamental, but I do kind of think about it that way. Yeah. I'm not sure there's any definition of the word fundamental that holds up to <laughs> all the scrutiny you might want to throw at it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there's some idea that certain certain things, whether they be concepts or objects or something, appear over and over and over again in nature, and we can use those things to kind of build up patterns and understand our universe. I feel like when we first talked about doing this episode, you were kind of more in the fundamental camp. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> But since doing the research and reading Anderson, did it change your mind about something? So I still don't think like Anderson and I would have shared our views. Like he really doesn't seem to like elementary particle <laughs> physics very much or care about things that are quote unquote fundamental. Um, and I do, I care about those things. I think mm -hmm. they're really interesting and important. And um, if you don't, understand those things, I don't think you can claim to understand your universe very well. What is his argument for not caring about it at all? I'm not sure that I understand it. I'm not sure he really tries to make one. I mean, maybe it's just a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. Not everyone wants to do the most fundamental science. <laughs> Even the physicists yeah. who study emergence, they don't, you know, they don't seem to mind that they're not studying fundamental particles. And, and I'm not sure that I would be able to give you a like good argument for why elementary particles are more important than Anderson's phase transitions or superconductivity or, or something. Or if you tried to do something like that, it would end up sounding like what we talked about in the beginning of like, yep. you know, it's like you could build everything else. Out, you could deduce everything from the fundamental particles, but we, we see that that's not really accurate. Yeah. So maybe if he and I were sitting here together, I would say... But Phil, you know, these electrons and quarks and Higgs bosons, that's what the universe is made of. That's what's so important. This is what I'm fascinated by. Why don't you think it's interesting? And he would say, well, but there's this beautiful collective behavior and superconductivity and, and, and symmetry breaking and stuff. Why don't you think that's as interesting as I do? <laughs> and maybe we just kind of have to agree yeah. to disagree. Today's episode was produced and edited by me, Shalma Wegsman. My co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. Dan is also an author and has written many books, including most recently, At the Edge of Time, Exploring the Mysteries of Our Universe's First Seconds. Thank you for all your support and for listening to our show. If you want to support us even more, you can subscribe to our Patreon, where you can ask us questions for exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes, as well as get the ad-free versions of our regular episodes. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash whythisuniverse.